Let's take a look at a raw workflow so that we can optimize images that are destined for the main editing space of Photoshop CS3. We'll start by selecting the Straighten tool. I'm going to click on one side of the horizon and drag to the other side as I have noticed this image is slightly crooked. As you can see a bounding box has appeared around the image which now straightens the image if opened. This is a non-destructive crop in that I can reclaim these pixels at any time in the future if I'm not entirely happy with the work that I've done in this editing space. The next step I'm going to take is to crop to a specific format or shape. Here I'm going to use a 2-3 format but I could create a custom format if one of the formats along here were not one of the formats that I decided to use. For instance, here I'm creating a custom crop which will use the 16.9 format, which is a format that is popular with widescreen TVs. And I could select OK. And here is the 16.9 format dropped over the image. I could reposition this crop marquee inside this format if I wanted to reframe the image. I'll return and go back to the 2-3 format, which was the original shape this image was captured in. I can click on the corner handles and extend the viewing area, like so. I can click inside the bounding box and reposition. I'm happy with the format now, so I'll move over to the next job in hand. I'm going to open up the Workflow Options dialog box. Here in the colour space I have to choose between three major spaces. Adobe RGB 1998 is the most suitable space for a print workflow that is destined for commercial printing CMYK. Profoto is a very large space that is suitable for high quality fine art reproductions using very sophisticated print output devices that have a broad gamut. sRGB is perhaps the most suitable space if we decide to send this image to the web for screen viewing as the sRGB space closely monitors most gamuts that are capable by your average monitor. I'm going to optimize this image for Adobe RGB 1998. If I can get the image looking really good in this workspace, then I could export the, the image to Photoshop as an 8 bits per channel image. If I intend to edit the color values and tonality a lot further in the main editing space, then it would be advisable to export at the 16 bits per channel, higher bit depth. I've already cropped down from the 10 megapixels that was originally captured, but if this is excessive, for what I'm intending the image for, I could sample down now. Here I've sampled down to 5.5 megapixels and here we can see the pixel dimensions and maybe this is suitable for the output device I have in mind. We can change the resolution. This resolution is suitable for an inkjet printer. I could increase this to 300 pixels per inch if it was destined for CMYK commercial printing or drop it to 100 pixels per inch if it's destined for web delivery. I also have the option of opening this image as a smart object. This will allow me to reopen the layer at any time into ACR, Adobe Camera Raw, and readjust any of the settings. Let's select OK in this editing space to set my workflow options. I'm now going to turn my attention to the white balance and the exposure and tonality of this image. Now at the moment the white balance we're using is the one that was assigned by the camera but this may not always be the most appropriate white balance to use. We can reassign a color temperature. Here by dragging the temperature slider to the right I could make the image warmer or dragging it to the left to make it cooler. We now have a custom white balance. The tint slider can also adjust the tint by moving, adding more green 
or magenta to the mix. Another way of assigning white balance is to come up to the tools and select the white balance tool. This allows me to come into an image area and select a neutral tone that I can find in the image to set a more appropriate white balance. This is really useful if we've used a photographer's grey card, a Gretek Macbeth colour checker or a white balance during the time of capture and we can set the white balance to this initial image before syncing or assigning the same white balance to subsequent images in the shoot. The next step I'm going to take is to increase the exposure. I'm going to drag the exposure slider to the right to make the image a lot brighter. We could raise this as much as perhaps one stop. Except now I'm getting some clipping information warnings from the top of the histogram here. If I click on this highlight clipping warning you'll see the colors appear in the main image window. Now I could either back off on the exposure to make sure that this tonal area is not clipped or I could bring in the new recovery slider to regain information in these highlights like so. We've now massaged the histogram and the highlight information back into the tonal range of the image. We also have a new fill light slider which will allow us to recover shadow tone which is too dark to print. But before we use this fill light slider I'm going to turn my attention to the blacks. As you can see there is no clipping warning for the blacks so the blacks look like they've been appropriately set. To check both the exposure, i.e. the 255 setting and the blacks, the zero setting, we can hold our finger down on the Option or Alt key and click to get a threshold view. If dots and lines appear, it's not too severe. But if large area of tones appear, that obviously means clipping is occurring and we're going to lose information in those important shadow tones. So we can wind back until we have very minimal clipping at all. Same, likewise, with the exposure slider. Again, holding down the Option or Alt key and clicking on shows whether we have any loss of information. As we increase the exposure slider, again, you'll see those clipping information coming in. And again, we can wind back until no clipping is occurring. If we move into the shadow areas, we can have a look at the RGB figures which will appear in this just underneath the histogram here. We can look at those values and see whether they're appropriate for the output device we have in mind. Here we have values over 20 and that should present no problem to a typical printer or even a magazine printing this image. So we won't, we won't need to use the fill light slider in this instance. The brightness and contrast controls are non-destructive in Adobe Camera Raw so we can adjust these to create the right feel and look and atmosphere of the image. Another option that we have down here are the vibrance and saturation sliders. Vibrance is new to Adobe Camera Raw 4. And perhaps in most instances it's better than using the saturation slider to create rich colors. Vibrance is reasonably non-destructive, meaning that we can increase saturation within the image without then creating clipping problems. It is still possible to clip, clip colors using the vibrant slider but it's less easy than using the old saturation slider which would tend to make all colors more saturated even the, even the ones that are already highly saturated and as you can see here we already have some clipping information. If I hold down the alt or option key and click on the blacks we can see we have color that is falling out of the gamut of Adobe RGB 1998. So I'll set the saturation to zero and instead increase the vibrance to plus 60.